on. Hi, and uh, welcome to another hour or so with inspiring writers in uh, the Pieces de Resistance series, a truly extraordinary benefit series celebrating Alaska Quarterly Review's 40th anniversary that features readings and conversations with exceptional new and emerging writers, as well as established authors and poets who like today's guests have all been published in AQR. You can find recordings of the previous programs at our website at aqreview.org um, or uh, our YouTube channel. Today we have three poets and essayists that in many ways are uh, beyond exceptional, if that's such a thing. Uh, uh, so honoring writers to be in room with them. I'm Heather Lundy and on behalf of the Center for Narrative and Lyric Arts, welcome. We're hosted by the Anchorage Museum at Rasmussen Center. And thank you. And thank you to our guest writers and to you for being here. Kunis as we say in Haines, Alaska, where I am today, on the banks of the Chilkat River on the homeland of the Clinket, Jilkat Kwan, and Jokut Kwan. While this reading is free, AQR, like all literary journals, could use your help. So please consider a donation. And thank you to those of you that have already donated. Now I'd like to introduce Ronald Spatz. Ron is the co-founder and editor-in-chief of Alaska Quarterly Review, a professor of English at the University of Alaska. Uh, he's a former National Endowment for the Arts Fellow and the recipient of two Alaska Governor's Awards and a contribution to Literary Award from the Alaska Center for the Book. Under Ron's four decades plus of leadership and vision, Alaska Quarterly Review has created strong connections between Alaska and the larger literary community in the United States and abroad. And AQR has been influential in supporting new and emerging writers, as well as presenting works that include a rigorous questioning of larger societal issues. Ron? Thank you, Heather, uh, and welcome everyone. Uh, as Heather said, uh, this event is being recorded and will be available on Alaska Quarterly Review YouTube channel. Before we begin, I'd like to make a few important acknowledgements. Alaska Quarterly Review acknowledges the Anchorage Museum for hosting and providing technical support for this event and Web 907 for its web support of Alaska Quarterly Review and the Center for the Narrative and Lyric Arts, Alaska Quarterly Reviews 501c3 umbrella organization, which makes this event possible. I also want to make a land acknowledgement. Alaska Quarterly Review recognizes indigenous land on which all Alaskans live. Alaska Quarterly Review is located in Anchorage and Anchorage is Denina homeland. Denina is the language spoken by the traditional present and future caretakers of this land. Land acknowledgement opens a space with gratefulness and respect for the contributions, innovations and contemporary perspective of indigenous peoples and marks our collective movement toward decolonization and equity. Today, we are so pleased to present a trio of fabulous poets, Felicia Zamora, um, Moria Simon and one of our um, key people at Alaska Quarterly as one of our contributing editors, uh, Peggy Shoemaker. Joining me today as co-moderator is Heather Lendy. Heather is the author of four books, all published by Algonquin. If you lived here, I'd know your name. Take good care of the garden and the dogs. Find the good, which is this year's Alaska Reads book and her most recently published book of Bears and Ballads. And now I begin to send it over to Heather. Thank you, Ron. And uh, it's my privilege really to introduce um, the three poets that we have today. Uh, Felicia Zamora is the author of six books of poetry, including I Always Carry My Bones, winner of the 2020 Iowa Poetry Prize, Body of Render, winner of the 2018 Benjamin Saltman Award, and A Form and Gather, 
winner of the 2016 Andre Montoya Poetry Prize. She's received fellowships and residencies from Canto Mundo, Ragdale Foundation, Playa, Moth Magazine, Nopi Center at Martha's Vineyard. Her poems appear in American Poetry Review, Boston Review, Georgia Review, Guernica, Missouri Review, Poem of the Week, Orion, The Nation, and others. She is an assistant professor of poetry at the University of Cincinnati and associate poetry editor for Colorado Review. Felicia Zamora, who said, the reality, our country and world are riddled with hate. The reality, there's a lot of work to do. The reality, if you wait for the utopian to miraculously appear, you are waiting in vain, friend. Roll up your sleeves, friends, and don't sit this one out. Our country needs your voice more now than ever. Race tensions run deep in this country. The more we let racism reign, let racism continue to slink covertly into our everyday existence, let historical racial amnesia sweep over the country, the scarier this place becomes. Let's hold each other up, she says, lift each other up. Quote, we must fight hate with education, love, resilience, and a strong collective voice. Your voice is your strength now. Let it be heard. Peggy Shoemaker is Professor Emerita from the University of Alaska Fairbanks and teaches in the Rainier Writing Workshop MFA at PLU. She serves on the advisory board for Story Knife, a women's writing retreat in Homer, Alaska, and on the board of the Alaska Arts and Culture Foundation. She is the editor of the Boreal Book Series, an imprint of Red Hen Press, editor of the Alaska Literary Series at the University of Alaska Press, poetry editor for Permis Persimmon Tree, and an Alaska Quarterly Review contributing editor, as Ron has said. But uh, above all, Peggy is a much beloved and admired Alaskan, a brilliant writer, and if it's possible, an even finer human being. She's an integral part of the Alaska literary community and has been for decades. As poet and director of Story Knife, Erin Coughlin Howell notes, there is not a writer in Alaska that Peggy has not supported and lifted up in some way, even when we don't know it. Peggy's generosity, along with her beloved Joe Usabelli, is boundless, and we thank her for it. Peggy was honored by the Rasmussen Foundation as its distinguished artist. She served as Alaska State Writer Laureate. She received a poetry fellowship from the National Endowment for the Arts and is the author of eight highly acclaimed books of poetry, including Cairn, her new and selected volume. Her lyrical memoir is Just Breathe Normally. Peggy Shoemaker, who said, part of making art and sharing that art with other people involves offering solace. Moria Simon is the author of 10 volumes of poetry, including Speaking in Tongues, a nominee for the 1990 Pulitzer Prize, Ghost Orchid, which was nominated in 2004 for a National Book Award in Poetry, Cartographies, and most recently, a limited edition letterpress book, Questions My Daughter Asked Me, Answers I Never Gave Them. Her poems have appeared in over 250 literary magazines, including Alaska Quarterly Review, The New Yorker, Poetry, Tri-Quarterly, The Southern Review, The Kenyon Review, The Georgia Review, The Gettysburg Review, Grand Street, Agni Plowshare, Shenandoah, the Los Angeles Times Book Review, the New England Review, and in more than 50 5 poetry anthologies. Moria Simon was the recipient of a poetry fellowship from the National Endowment for the Arts and a university award from the Academy of American Poets. The Cecil uh, B. Wagner and Lucille Medwick Memorial Awards from the Poetry Society of America. And she was a 1991 Fulbright Indo-American Fellow, um, which allowed her a six month long writing sojourn in Bangalore, India, South India. Moria's poetry, it has been noted, often combines the natural world with spirituality and metaphysics. Her writing is enlightened by the classics and art and attentive to formal traditions. Reviewer Deborah Bogan wrote, Quote, Simon's poems make it clear that the maps she is intent on making in her book, specifically cartographies, are body-born and body-bound. They lead us deep into the poet's life as a soul searcher, a mother, a wife, mountain dweller, and a citizen of the larger world with its troubling truths and shifting boundaries. 
We'll begin with Felicia and then to Peggy and finally to Moria. And, and hopefully there'll be some time at the end for the three of them, you, <laughs> to exchange some thoughts on, on, on what you do and why. Felicia. Thank you so much, Heather, for that fabulous introduction. And Ron also for inviting us all here. I am so deeply honored to be reading with Peggy and Moria um, and, and sharing this space with all of you as, as poets and those who are listening at home today. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, thank you also for being here for Alaska Quarterly Review. Um, as, as a writer, I really feel that journals have a relationship with us. Um, for me, so often journals give us our, our platform. They give us a space to be part of that larger conversation in creative writing, in the arts and in poetry. And Alaska Quarterly, Quarterly Review has been a space for me as well. And so this is, yes, honoring them for, for their birthday, but also, um, you know, it is a fundraiser as well. So every little bit does help and we appreciate you and I appreciate being part of this wonderful reading series. I'm going to read a few pieces, um, starting with uh, a poem about um, really what's, what's on my mind right now. I hope that you'll see that these poems are coming from an insistence of what must be on the page and what must be said at the moment. Used to be. The dead minks in Denmark make me think about language, the way we hide and package in sound bites. 15 million minks killed over COVID-19 infections. USA Today uses the words slaughter, then cull, why the article dances with images of furry zombies rising from graves, explained easily by rushed burials and shallow plots. The pandemic rushes and slows time and minds in unfathomable superpower-esque ways these days. These days, another consideration of language unprecedented times. I saw a, on social, I saw a joke posted, could really use some precedented times. I wanted to laugh. The bridge between want and fruition collapsed for me in June, 2020. I'm still hunting for a contractor, magician with the tools to repair a damage I don't fully understand. We used to be all right. We used to be okay. We used to hug and hold and greet friends with double kisses on cheeks, shake hands, pull babies not ours into our arms the shape of cradles, eat pozzoli with spittle flying from our tongues in boisterous laughter amid dim lights of a packed restaurant, dance with our heat and sweat pressed to a stranger, lover, one in the same for the night. Fuck in back alleys on planes, on swaying decks near boathouses. Clasp hands and lines to create bodies as roadblocks. Bury our dead and weep into shoulders of loved ones with only our mourning and not thoughts of saliva or transmission. And we knew what the face of our deceased looked like before burial, before cremation. And we celebrated the life taken from us too soon too soon. We used to be all right. We used to be okay. We used to be. Neuron fire, or I want brown and black and queer joy to be ubiquitous, or what we're made of connects us, fuck. Or I'm writing this poem when I should be out protesting, so this poem is a protest instead. I wonder about vulnerability and visage, how my third metacarpal smacks into wood and the purple's surface skin long before tender, before my eyes package up the scene for nerve cells to detect in a type of mystery only cells talking solves. I carve a love poem to my body inside the skull. In hopes all eyes roll back far enough 
to read my inscription in shitty penmanship. In maturation outside the womb, to explain our thinking means a study of brain chemicals, electrical signals, neurons as neighbors, cityscapes under flesh. Our thoughts propagate in neuron fire. Waves of waves of waves, signals of us, compounds and coalesce. Peel us back to reveal a galaxy of burning, hydrogen and helium and churn of nuclear forges in our guts. Heaven held in the pinpricks of pinpricks. My body a constellation of elements of stars gone supernova. Transient and astronomical my atoms. Stellar explosion gives me assemblage in a last evolutionary stage before dying. Meditations on flesh. An ulcer develops inside my lower lip in crevice of gum line. The translucent milky gray pox oral mucosa landscape of dark pink. And I remember my flesh incubates. A home for a short lived tenants involving a kind of thought come to life in the mouth, carrying the acts of membranes and cells. What haunts the body sometimes haunts from interior vantage. The ground squirrel in California chews on rattlesnake skin, spits out the paste to apply on its body. A confused rattlesnake smells its own deadly hesitates at the familiar venom. I look in the mirror and think of all my jaws chew and spit out. I both predator and prey. How language thistles on my tongue in stick to flesh laid bare, pulmonary artery in exposed from lick. Environment changes us. In the Alden Motel, Stray cats brought fleas, my ankles swollen and torn from indentations of my own nails. Dust mites cause allergic fits, stuffy nose, watery, watery eyes, lack of smell for weeks on end. Nudibranches change skin coloration by changing diet. Octopi camouflage their bodies when threatened. Octopi swim fast, swim fast, an open ocean. Butterfly wings contain eye spots, circular patterns to resemble the eyes of larger animals, to confuse and misdirect with disruptive coloration. The monarch butterfly uses aposematism to ward off prey. Sometimes we hide, sometimes illuminate to keep ourselves alive. The polar bear's physicality acts as prism. Black skin under translucent fur reflects the sun to only appear white. In art, black contains the presence of all colors. In physics and spectrum, the opposite. To understand the human condition, we must acknowledge both theories exist simultaneously and in tandem. When my mother warned, if you touch the monarch's butterfly wing, she'll never return home, she dies. My finger already on the wing, too late to release, too early to understand the lie. My left knee contains asphalt from a childhood bike accident. Three kids on one dirt bike and a serious hill. My brother held my chin in his palm to the top of the hill don't look down. Only when I saw the blood, I cried. Only when I saw the blood, I felt the rip and sear of missing skin. Blue-green scar plumps and circles, itches when cold, itches long before the rest of my leg. Biochromes absorb and reflect certain wavelengths of light. Octopi harbor these microscopic pigments to change color and patterns and even opacity. 
to be able to see inside, become more sheer. If our skin melts transparent, if our inner workings expose, blink and glow like moon jellyfish in deep ocean, would we see each other, feel our connectivity, or sour that too? National Geographic tells me a rhyme on how to remember what snake patterns to be cautious of. Red on yellow kills a fellow. Red on black won't hurt Jack. The lines catch and repeat in my mind. In summer 2020, a Starbucks barista asked the white woman to wear a required mask. She attacked him. His friends raised a thousand K in GoFundMe. The woman sued for half. Red on yellow. In seeing maggots on a deer carcass, my skin crawls as I watch their bodies writhe in and around each other, squirm in compost, fly larva to be exact. Wikipedia says the word maggot doesn't exist as a technical term or an entomology. Perhaps my reaction stems from misunderstanding. Perhaps the heap of bodies clangs a bell, reminds me of love, a closeness gone missing. And I have one more piece to share tonight. And um, because I am reading with Peggy and Moria, I'd like to, to dedicate this to, to us um, as women and to all women who are listening tonight. Chris Martin sings Shiver and I Shiver, a poem for Madam Vice President. This poem isn't for Coldplay or rock and roll or the Honda speakers or the 275 on-ramp to Dayton, Ohio on November 11th. This poem isn't for Martin, isn't for the way his stool shook at the First Avenue Club where I touched his foot, sweaty palmed and sweaty breasted before Apple, before Madison Square and mouthed, this Coldplay's gonna be big. This poem isn't for my grandfather or his, you'll never amount to anything, gutturals, his, you dirty spick, waste of sperm, pupils in spit at my brown body, my brown irises. This poem isn't for the associate provost who pulled me into his office after the 2016 election saying, we liberals will always be disadvantaged, Felicia, because we're unwilling to do horrid things to win. After asking me about my undocumented family, after asking, you're Mexican, right? This poem is not for his damaging white liberalism. This poem isn't for the playground splashed with my blood after being punched in the face by the kid a grade above me and fucking taco in his saliva isn't for the asphalt, the snicker, or that kid, all those kids. This poem is for Kamala Harris, Madam Vice President Kamala Harris. This poem is for my little brown body between my grandfather and the television, alert and still not running away, a demand to be seen. This poem is for my moon boots, thrift store gems, and the tip of the right boot in that kid's groin. This is for my mother. This poem is for my mother, who wrote nine children's books in the 80s and not one accepted for publication. This poem is for the bear that changes colors, glasses for Tommy Tiger, Betty Butterfly's strange mirror, and the author's signature, Linda Zamora for the reason I became a poet, to write a poem to Madam Vice President, to say the word possibility and believe it. This poem is for the trillions of false litanies to women. You can't X, can't Y, don't Z, don't X, cunt, you shouldn't Y, you shouldn't X, fuck off, you don't belong, don't get your panties in a bunch, let me mansplain X, relax. It's just a joke. You wanted this. May this match burn these all down. 
This poem is for women. This poem is for trans women. This poem is for queer women. This poem is for black women. This poem is for brown women. This poem is for Truth and Tubman and Parks. This poem is for Dove and Hooks and Sanchez. This poem is for Anzaldúa, Baez, Cisneros. This poem is for women. This poem is for Madam Vice President Kamala Harris. This poem is how is how is for how Martin sings shiver and I shiver at your smile the night the electoral votes hit 290 blue. I see my face in your smile, all the faces of history. I shiver for history. I shiver for my smile inside your smile. I shiver for the necessity of shivering long overdue, shivers of shivers. This poem is for the guzzle. This poem is a guzzle because it's a worldview. We stitch the stars down to earth now. We stitch the stars deep inside the soil of us, cells, saltwater guts. We stitch with hair and wishbones for eyes, stitch until fingers bleed, and then we stitch on top of the stitches. We taught ourselves to sew. We taught ourselves out of invisibility, the difference between the shadow cast and the body and yet part of the body and how a shadow means a body exists, a body in light. Step in, dear sisters, step in. Thank you. Thank you. Delicia. Are we ready? Yes. Felicia, thank you so much. Um, before I read, and I'm Peggy, by the way, I'd like to offer huge thanks to Ron Spatz. Thanks as a writer for the hospitality that he showed to my work and to the work of so many other people. And thanks as a reader. Uh, for more than 40 years, he has gleaned from enormous stacks of manuscripts, the finest poems and stories and essays and photographs and artwork that he could find. And those were from Alaska and from around the world. Ron has created a large part of Alaska's literary community and I'm grateful. Um, thanks too to AQR staff and volunteers to Heather Lendy and to Rebecca at the Anchorage Museum who is behind the scenes making this all work. Thanks as well to Felicia and Moria. I am so honored to read with you. And I hope everyone listening will join us in supporting AQR. Felicia, I'm still shivering from your poems. I'm gonna bookend my reading with poems that appeared in the pages of AQR. And this was in the very first batch that Ron accepted. It takes place near Seward. Well, it begins in a place near Seward. Exit Glacier. When we got close enough, we could hear rivers inside the ice, heaving splits, the groaning of a ledge about to calf. Strewn in the moraine, fresh moose sign, tawny oblong pellets breaking up sharp black shale. In one breath, ice and air. History, the record of breaking. Prophecy, the warning of what's yet to break. Out from under, four stories, a bone crushing turquoise retreating. I find in recent work an elegiac impulse uh, for reasons clear to us all. Came a sickness. The people were used to dying one at a time. Then came a sickness upon the land, came a sickness to every nation, came a sickness that killed the already ill, killed 
those who had not known sickness, killed the generous who cared for the dying, killed the careless, killed those who embraced worship, killed those who touched no God. The people were used to grieving by gathering, gathering the goodness of each person brought to the world. Left, bereft, we masked ourselves. So many at once, gone, without touching, without goodbye, without rights perfected over centuries. Came more sickness of mind, scams, lies, the constant, deliberate train crash of lies. Came fine minds crafting vaccines. Came for the lucky recovery. Came brown, blue, hazel, green eyes above cloth seeking other eyes. Came deep grief opening rituals we'd never touched. Breathe in, breathe out this air we share, each breath a blessing, each breath a prayer. Mm. Eva Salidas was an amazing marine biologist, an essay, a poet, essayist, and a poet. And this poem came from a moment that we shared almost. Gifts we cannot keep. At the old Kona airport, past soccer fields and abandoned hangars, cracked up asphalt spreads, taxiways for miles parallel the Pacific. We just come from body flow, a class that, in your words, kicked my ass. By then though, you caught a second wind. You wanted a run. I have never wanted a run. We did not yet know what coursed again inside you. You took off gazelle and grubby gym clothes. I clambered up onto lava rocks to watch the surf. White foam turned spume over jagged black. Your study animals, orcas, white and black, far from here, gorged on seals and porpoise. You knew already that after the spill, you were witnessing their last days, listening underwater for the language spoken only by this pod, pod that after the spill did not make babies. You saved your breath for prayers in wind for poems and songs and long hours glassing the water. We had no way then to know that they were back, the cells that could not control themselves, those cells. You ran beyond where I could see. I faced the vast waters. One moment calm, then the ocean explodes, barnacle crusted humpback, full body breach splashes me, wild eye, huge and watching, whale pausing like Barishnikov in rarefied air. The great gift of all we cannot know, laid out before us, broken as asphalt, mended as water men then men's again. Uh, the prolifically, or no, prodigiously talented Sherry Simpson married her husband, Scott Kiefer, very young. She died unexpectedly a few months ago, not of the virus. Letter to one sitting vigil. 
for Scott Kiefer and Sherry Simpson. Since your teens, you loved one another. Set out feeders for hummingbirds by the dozen. Fought wildfires in scrub brush in your marriage. Roasted green chilies, made music, talked endlessly. The conversation, a life you made together, your home, the one neither of you could have made alone. Shared dogs, beloved beyond measure. Shared the high drama of every day. Arguments you weren't sure you'd survive, but did. Celebrated private jokes intimate as bed covers. So the earth shifts this morning in hospice when you lean to kiss her and whisper to her fierce, rugged heart. Thank you. Hush now. You've done all you could. Sometimes the right thing to do is awful, but no matter how difficult, it's still right. My beloved um, husband recently signed a piece of paper. I think I can get through it. Do not resuscitate. You weren't afraid, you say, when you put pen to paper to instruct those who might restart your stopped heart not to. No, not afraid, more calm, this danger orange form making clear to ones who know nothing of you, clear too to those who love you well, that you're mindful, your time breathing easy on this earth is short, your plenty mostly spent. Great love, piloting your amphibious widgeon, landing on water wild and remote, or off a tiny island in Fiji, night diving, watching soft corals open their mouths, millions of mouths filled with want. Blue ribbon eels coughing, that considerable current pulling us fast, and you dream flying, letting it take you. I'll end with another AQR poem, and I thank you everyone for sharing this time. In the far north, light is returning. And this poem takes place just before the light is coming back much. Uh, long before we got here, long after we're gone. In the season, blue white sun barely lifts above the ridge limps along the horizon, then dives out of sight. We're changed each day by light. Someone who's gone before broke trail, set tracks. With the right kick wax, we make our way among birch, breathing hard, rare, frosted light. We make of light Arpeggio crystals, caribou dance bands, shush of bristles. One moment made alive, human, unafraid. All that's lost, not gone. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Peggy, very much. Thank you.
Moria. Sorry about that. I always forget to unmute myself. Thank you both, um, Peggy and Felicia, for those amazing readings. Peggy, your poems always seem to be telling people how to, or showing people how to enjoy life or how to endure it. And I so value them for that. And Felicia, your poems are about celebration and confrontation, and it's wonderful the way you combine those things. Um, thank you so much for your poems. And many thanks to Heather and to Ron and to the invisible Rebecca behind the scenes. And to everyone who's tuned in today during the Super Bowl, um, which we really appreciate. And I will read, uh, I think because I'm feeling a little off today from having my second vaccine, um, I'm going to read some odd poems. And partly because uh, it's National Ferrucini Alfredo Day, you can make of that what you like. And also because of the Super Bowl, because it is, I think, um, one of our most brutal of pastimes, of American pastimes. Um, and so I'm going to read, start with a poem that's about brutality. And it is a theory of eyebrows. Um, all right, I think I, I need say no more. It's in seven very brief parts. A theory of eyebrows. With pipe bombs wedged in their baby's backpack, the wedded San Bernardino terrorists sped away from their targets, their black pupils dilating from an aftermath of vengeful murder. Their eyebrows drooping parentheses to those hate enveloped eyes. Their retinas shattering into icy splinters as they were shot, their eyebrows beating with blood. Two, Adolf Hitler's eyebrows wouldn't accept the brow beatings by his father. Out he plucked them, hair by hair, each night, and planted them underneath his dresser's daily folded ironed underwear. But Adolf's eyebrows grew back more massive and bristly than a wild boar's, became even more abhorrent to him, because became iron weights, those eyebrows redolent of imminent death, the source of his profound shame. Three, a little known fact, a redhead, a brunette, a blonde, and predictably a black haired rider, the four weary horsemen of the apocalypse use their scythes to shave off their bristling eyebrows, then waxed and sharpened them to use as secret weapons, ingenious and multicolored razors, needles, tiny ice picks, miniature daggers. Four, and don't forget the pale eyebrows of Petra Laszlo, that Hungarian broadcaster who tripped a Syrian man and his small boy bedraggled refugees as they fled to freedom. Two weeks later, her adorable eyebrows turned into skin lice and chewed off half her face. Five. Of course, Kim Jong-il's black baronet hairstyle, hair shaved off the sides and back of his head, hair jelly rolled into a mini tsunami up on top, caused his eyebrows to contract to half their normal size. Thus, his doctors surgically removed his traumatized truncated eyebrows, replacing them with a self-regenerating fungus that sadly stinks like raw sewage. Six, 
Joe Stalin's hirsute brows were powdered and powered by a genetic link to a Neanderthal tribe which practiced ritualized infanticide of male newborns with jade green eyes or ungainly noses. That was most offspring that fall, a terrible slaughter. Hence Stalin's penchant for brutality, mayhem, the starvation of millions, and his remarkably stalwart eyebrows. It's an open secret that after his death and embalming, Stalin's eyebrows detached themselves as he lay in state, then slid off his corpulent face and like inchworms, moved down his trousers to his shrunken genitals. There, they set up shop selling tiny squares of rotting flesh on the black market to bereft yet very grateful mourners. Today, those minute computer chips of cruelty, when dropped in a glass of water, detonate as powerfully as not so smart bombs. Seven. Once a stately black unibrow, my own eyebrows separated in middle age and now appear as mere shadows of their former self. No longer am I mistaken for an Anglo Frida Kahlo, no more taunts by my wisecracking daughters, my eyebrows turn grayer and grayer like mold on yogurt. Still, there's always a lesson to be had. Countering our moral turpitude, our eyebrows serve as our faces stewards, twin sentries of truth, fine chaperones of our integrity. Don't try to fool them, their power is divine. A pastoral. Dictator Idi Amin's 100 room wildlife lodge scattered along Uganda's White Nile is now a ruin housing warthog families sheltering in its kitchens, as well as armored pangolins and porcupines who scout out mossy bedrooms and crumbling verandas. Occasionally smirking jackals, leopards, and red-assed baboons prowl the vacant rooms, sniffing the scent of smaller game and doing a variegated dance of reclamation. Somehow they coexist harmoniously, these overlords of hunger, while the ghosts of 300,000 souls who Amin killed roam the savannah's rough lands like barren winds. How ephemeral our lives how utterly reliant on blind luck or circumstance. I think if anything these past four years under the reign and terror of our former president, it's made my poetry so much more politically engaged than it ever was. And I've seen that in a lot of other people um, because that is one of the great powers of poetry is to help us uh, resist tyranny and to speak out and to, um, to speak truth to power, I suppose. Um, so I will read uh, two more short poems and then a longer one. Uh, this one's called Lockdown, something with which we're all familiar, all too familiar. Lockdown. My mind is cobwebbed from too much stillness. My body's a low-slung dirigible grazing the rooftops of invisible cities. Too long, this warehouse of solitude, too wide, too laden with dire shadows. The ping of a dropped pin 
echoes with a sledgehammer's force. But a distant high meadow beckons, its bee-hobbled clover dipping in the breeze. Meet me there in spring, when the world restarts, there where deer ticks climb long blades of grass, poised to launch themselves onto our shins, there in Eve's forsaken paradise, ours again, and still glistening with minarets of dew. Post-Pleistocene Blues. Cheetahs once wandered the jungles of Nebraska alongside other megafauna like short-faced bears and the lumbering Colombian mammoths. Hundreds of these beasts waded into a vast lake in Southeast Dakota's savannas and drowned after being sucked into quicksand mud. Over millennia, they fused into a many-storied high-rise of fossilized skulls, rib cages, and tusks. Though time is a finite resource, some species squander it, like us. And I'm gonna end with a poem um, that's an elegy for my father. Uh, tomorrow would have been, February 8th, would have been my father's um, 98th birthday. And he was a profound influence on my life in many, many ways. He was a, a composer and a musician, ethnomusicologist, um, and a difficult man, to say the least. This is a poem that appeared very recently in the Hudson Review. And it's a poem also that um, is part of a suite of poems I wrote and have been writing over the last few years that are meditations on different uh, punctuation marks. So I've written odes to question marks and exclamation marks and commas and periods and hyphens and dashes. And this one is about magic bullets, you know, those little dots on the left side of a a document uh, that set off different points. And it's called Magic Bullets, A Meditation on Loss. Like a slow bullet, an errant clot of blood stopped a vessel's flow to your brain, father, and you became a distant village on an icy winter's night. It's your familiar thoughts I miss, what fled before I could say farewell. Your mind, once my native land, now seems an abandoned plain. Father, father, here is my short list of sorrows, the incense trail my pliant memory draws forth while your mind shuffles its scumbled dreams. In Fontainebleau, 50 years ago, I followed you into a tall forest to cut down a pine for the solstice. I asked, is the tree sap its tears? You wept later, our car having struck a doe. <clears throat> I've never seen tears stream down your face, nor your shame and utter speechlessness. We all feared your anger, your acerbic tongue. It was the adder kept secreted in your voice box, its poison sudden, deadly. Where has it gone? But music, music, first and last, its beauty empowering you for 80 years, you, Father, our maestro, tempo tyrant, joy's conductor. Those glorious years in Hermosa Beach where the ocean's choirs enlivened us as our family strolled along the shore, you singing along in your perfect alto solo, 
we grow old, we grow old, we shall wear the bottoms of our trousers rolled. Your dark complexity baffling, your moods an archipelago across which aisles I'd hop, skip and jump, so terrified of drowning. Your winds and currents still a mystery, your remote terrains, your unspoken griefs, were 30 years of adultery an antidote? How can a brilliant mind take a sabbatical? Your university lectures made my heart race around in circles with pride when I was 20. For somehow you translated Bach, Brahms, jazz, and ragas into great monuments of sound, though he, later you said you'd felt stripped naked, deficient haunted your face now, father, though chiseled, handsome, with your aquiline nose, your bright sapphire eyes. Your mouth is mine, nearly lipless, ever hungry. Astonishing a father's strangeness to his daughter. Twice in a blue moon, you'd fired a gun, and each time its blast had jolted you back into the world as if the war, the army, and your fear of dying awoke in you both the fragility and the ferocity of consciousness. Bullets are emblems both for war and healing, but I prefer them as glyphs drawn on the page, as leaves, buds, chevrons, or diamonds. I want your mind back as it was, Father, shining. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Maria. Very much, Maria. That was beautiful. And thank all of you. We just have a few minutes, but I, I, I'm just struck by each of you. Basically, as Peggy said, you know, sort of focusing on the allegiance quality of these times and what, what we've lost. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of wondering as we move forward, especially because Maria, you, you mentioned your um, vaccine and the, and, and Felicia, you talked about Kamala, of course, and the, and the change. Do you, do you as poets and as women and as writers feel like you found something during this time as well that perhaps will take us forward in a, in a new and um, different direction. And if you don't want to talk about that, that's okay. You could talk about anything you'd like. <laughs> but I just, I, I was just thinking about that right now. If, if coming out of this, there's, there's something else that, that women and particularly poets and writers are, are going to kind of an influence that we may have. I found that being crushed by grief makes writing very difficult. Um, but this morning I read Erin uh, Hollowell's blog. She has a blog called um, Being Poetry. And she talked about how elegy and ode are north and south. That's Arthur Zay's observation. And it makes sense to me that we celebrate and we mourn and those things are together, those things are part of one another. So thank you, Erin, for putting that into words. And Felicia, you don't have yourself unmuted. <laughs> no, I, I don't, because I'm thinking. <laughs> I think, I, I think it, that's a complicated question because um, largely we're, we're in this right now, right? Like we are in the pandemic so much that we, we're barely, at least for me, I'm barely able to know and to understand my own day-to-day -day reactions, let alone uh, the repercussions and what will, will come of us as a species once the pandemic is over. And not to mention like simultaneously while we have the pandemic, the civil unrest from um, the murders of Black lives in this in this country, um, as well as um, 
you know, the pandemic is, is hitting the indigenous population and black population way harder than, than, um, than, than white individuals. And all of this is just kind of swirling around. So it's, it's hard for me right now to know what I'm learning. Um, I, I recently read both Zadie Smith's Intimations and Ross Gay's Book of Delights. And I'm just desperately trying to hold on to, to delights and joy every day, no matter how small they are. Um, and so I think what will come of this in my art has yet to develop. Even though all these poems are new poems, it, it's a seeking. I, I'm seeking right now too. Well, I'll give back to you something you said that I think is very wise. And I don't have it exactly, but you said to see inside, to become more sheer, um, then maybe we could see each other. And I think that that's part of our job is to try to see one another. Yeah. Trying to answer your question, Heather. Um, I think we each, it seems to me, at least in the poems that I heard today by Peggy and Felicia, there's a, a kind of yearning for or seeking of balance in people's, in, in, in these two poets' lives and maybe in, in most of our lives. Um, Peggy mentioned the, the north and south of the um, ode and the elegy. Um, and we're, we're always trying to balance, I think, the sacred and the profane, um, the outer self and the inner self. And it, somehow that, that, that kind of balancing act seems to be intensified by the pandemic, um, maybe because we are more interior. We spend more time alone, I think, um, during this time. Anyway, I, I, I think achieving a balance at this point in history and in our lives is, is really hard and necessary, both. And then, uh, thank you. And, and Peggy, um, you know, you talk about the struggle of these times and I think, and Felicia, I mean, yeah, we're like crushed. We're all kind of a mess all the time and uh, creative people, I think um, it, it hits even more when you're an empath, you know, um, so um, perhaps if, if 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 work is difficult, if 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 writing about it is difficult, um, and Felicia, thank you for mentioning what you're reading. What 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 would you recommend that we should take a look at and read again, or go to right now? Um, and maybe is it is there something that you you look to for some sort of <laughs> balance or? or inspiration? I have, to say, I have to admit, I'm into pure escapism most of the time. <laughs> so I read murder mysteries and, you know, anything that can kind of get me away from the moment, <laughs> you know, a lot of the time. And that's a, a guilty admission. But um, sometimes we need to escape, or I need to escape what's going on. Certainly politically, the last four years have been a nightmare. And so anything that lifts my spirits or, or distracts them. And I'm interested in what Felicia and Peggy would recommend. I'll just tell you that during the Red Mirage, when I was horrified and my stomach was clenched, thinking that we might have another four years of nightmares, um, I began reading Scott Russell Sanders' book, The Way of Imagination, mm -hmm. and he in these essays um, talks in his earnest way about how imagination is the only way that we're going to be able to picture something better and the only way that we're going to be able to move toward it. And I think that he's brilliant in that way. I also read a book of essays by a young Alaska writer named Karina Cook called Leave Takings and I recommend it to you. Um, so many poets, I don't know how to choose. So somebody else talk and then I'll tell you. <laughs> oh. a, a couple books that have just um, cored me lately have been um, The History of My Brief Body by Billy Ray Belcourt is a Canadian poet and essayist. Um, that uh, compilation of essayettes was extremely powerful for me. Um, Hyde Erdridge's um, 
Little Big Bully um, is, a, is another one that I just finished. Um, I'm currently reading Michael Torres's um, uh, An Incomplete List of Names. Uh, and I'm trying to, I actually have like, I'm surrounded by the books that I'm, that I'm reading. <laughs> Um, there, there's just so many. And, you know, I, I think I find I'm really drawn to voices that are very different than mine and experiences that are different in mine, because I do think that there is a sifting through the trauma and the sifting through what one must endure in this country and beyond this country um, to find what love is to find how we, we do see each other. Um, and I don't know, I'm, I've always been a really huge proponent that horror and beauty are not opposites. They're actually usually one and the same. Um, and it's how, how we hold that and react to it that kind of matters. Thank you, I think that's a really nice, um, place to close and a, a good thing for us all to remember in the in the middle of horror beauty um, and I really want to thank all three of you for um, being here today um, I just feel wiser and richer for the experience so thank you uh, very much and for taking the time out um, uh, to be here today and I also want to thank all of you for joining um, this uh, AQR's 40th uh, anniversary Literary Series, and on behalf of the Center for the Narrative and Lyric Arts, and also all of our gratitude for um, uh, today for the Anchorage Museum at the Rasmussen Center, and Rebecca Potterbaum for making this happen, uh, the staff at the Anchorage Museum, and again, to remind you to please uh, consider making a donation to Alaska Quarterly Review so that we can uh, continue another 40 years and uh, to help us reach our our modest fundraising goal of $15,000. So I thank you uh, very much. And I hope you all have a, uh, a safe and um, uh, a pleasant week and um, that you take care of yourselves. And, and if you can, you can take care of somebody else too. And Ron? Yeah, thank you, Heather. <clears throat> and thank you, Peggy and Moria and Felicia. What powerful, moving. Um, poems. So thank you for participating. And um, thank you, Heather, for what you do. And um, next Sunday, Valentine's Day, um, we're featuring a, tri a trio of uh, award-winning AQR fiction writers whose work um, has been uh, recognized by the O. Henry Prize stories that from work that appeared in AQR and the Best American Short Stories. Carrie Holiday, Ashley Wurzbacher, and Daniel J. O'Malley. So we hope we, uh, we see everybody uh, next week and thank everyone for joining us. <laughs>